Uh, good morning and welcome. I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the City Council and also Acting Public Advocate. You're welcome, Kelman Yeager. In my dual role, I am here to provide in oversight, uh, a fundamental power of the legislative branch as the Acting Public Advocate. I'm also focused on examining the city's responsiveness to concerns New Yorkers register through 311. Uh, what we are getting right and what we could be doing better. I want to thank our Governmental Operations Committee Chair, Fernando Cabrera. He has been an incredibly dedicated partner on this issue, so I want to thank him. Today we're going to examine agency responsiveness to through and one requests. Much of our discussion will be based on 2018 data that is available <clears throat> to the public on the NYC Open Data Portal, where it is updated daily. This is a great tool of government transparency, and the City Council hosts several maps and charts on our website that analyze through on one data and tell New Yorkers where through on one requests are being made and what concerns are important to communities. But this information is only as valuable as the quality of the data that through on one collects. We are concerned with ensuring that New Yorkers are receiving timely responses to their requests and that the 301 system is as robust and useful as possible. Unfortunately, we see extensive data quality issues. There are pervasive data errors that impede the ability of the public to understand how quickly agencies respond to complaints. There are also ambiguous complaint resolution descriptions that make it impossible to know how the agency in question responded to certain complaints, and also the poor quality of complaint resolution statuses makes a high number of complaints received through the 301 system appear inconclusive or unresolved. Based on the data, we unfortunately don't know when, how, or even if many complaints were actually resolved. For example, Nearly all of the complaints, <clears throat> excuse me, nearly all of the complaints handled by the Taxi and Limousine Commission and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene are technically marked closed, but appear to be ongoing. We're talking about 99% of TLC complaints and 99% of DOHMH complaints here. TLC's most common complaint resolution just says that TLC will contact you in 14 days to confirm your complaint details. How do we know when or if TLC actually resolved the complaint? About 20% of rodent complaints were reportedly addressed by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene before the complaint was ever even submitted. How is that possible? For the other 80% of rodent complaints, the complaint resolution just says that DOHMH will review your complaint and the complaint will probably result in an inspection and a call back in 30 days for status. How do we know when or if DOHMH actually resolved the complaint? Why can't the complaint status simply be updated once action has occurred? Roughly 46 of complaints handled by the Department of Transportation have a vague resolution description, which just says that service request status is available on DOT's website. Again, how do we know what DOT actually did to resolve the complaint? Similarly, roughly 74% of complaints handled by the Department of Finance were also ambiguous. Thousands are updated to, quote, we have researched your claims, unquote. How do we know if the Department of Finance actually resolved the complaint? We don't know. Some agencies resolve cases quickly at first and then slow down, then show a sudden spike around a certain time. DOT usually takes about two weeks to resolve street, si street sign complaints, but closes out nearly 10% of those complaints right around the 180 day mark. Is this a true reflection of when DOT has resolved these cases? Despite these troubling issues, we do see some very positive things from the data. And I wanna, com I wanna commend specifically the Department of Sanitation for their clarity and responsiveness. 50% of their cases are marked fixed and they have zero ambiguous resolution descriptions. So I wanna thank the Department of Sanitation. I hope that today we'll hear commitments from 311 and from all of the agencies present that data accuracy and clear and constant communications with the public will be a priority moving forward. So I wanna thank you all for being here. 
I want to turn it over to our governmental operations chair for his opening statement. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am the chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, Council Member Fernando Cabrera. We are pleased to be joined today by the speaker and acting public advocate, Corey Johnson, who has given us an incredible leadership on this issue, uh, uh, on the issues related to 311. Today we will be conducting oversight on agency rep responsiveness to 311 requests, service requests. As you will recall, the last hearing with 311 in January dealt with the call taking system and improving system features to better serve New Yorkers. Today, we're asking what happens once agencies receive service requests from 311. We are also hearing one piece of legislation today. I will describe it briefly, but the sponsor can discuss it, discuss it in detail. Introduction 1002 of 2018, sponsored by Councilmember Holden in relation to requiring the 311 Customer Service Center to indicate that an agency is unable to respond to a service request or complaint. This bill will require 311 to indicate in a service request status update when the agency in question is unable to take action on a request. This information will be publicly available to the original 311 complainant. 311 is only as valuable as the response it generates, and the public only knows their complaints as being responded to when agencies provide information back to them. New Yorkers should be able to trust that a complaint filed with 311 will not language in a void, but will respond to promptly and include an accurate status update. Unfortunately, the 311 data we have seen shows very uneven response times and accuracy and status updates. Today, we want to hear how 311 and agencies are working together to ensure that 311 is as robust as it could be as the nation's largest non-emergency call center. I would like to thank, to again thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for joining us today and the sponsor of this legislation being heard today, Council Member Holden. I would also like to thank our staff whose work made this hearing possible. Brad Ree, Elizabeth Cronk, Emily Forjom, Zach Harris, Al Musawi, Julia Fredenberg, Ben Witt, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevin. I will now turn the microphone over to Council Member Holden to speak on his bill. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. And uh, thanks, Speaker, and po Acting Public Advocate for your, your words. Uh, we all know that 311 is a useful tool for constituents to report to respective city agencies the quality of life concerns that they have. City agencies respond to all types of concerns, from illegal parking to heat or hot water complaints to derelict vehicles and or the lack of garbage pickup. Uh, I use 311 app and see requests close untruthfully. And, I can't tell you how many times I called about a car at a hydrant. Um, you get up the next morning, you get the request that said the car is not there, and I get up and I look and it's there. So what is going on? Who's you know, not telling the truth? We know that a lot of police uh, calls uh, are closed untruthfully, and I want to I get to a number of, of issues, but um, uh, I understand that you know, an abundance of, of requests, city agencies, especially like I mentioned the NYPD, cannot adjudicate all requests in a timely fashion. We need to know that. We need to see that. And we need to hear that. Um, uh, intro 1002 would ensure that each service request is closed truthfully. And that's not too much to ask, folks, uh, that we get the truth. Uh, so if an agency is unable to respond, it would be, they would be obligated to close the 311 request stating that they could not respond to the request for service. Um, the City Council is for to increase uh, transparency in city government, and this bill calls for increased transparency for all our agencies. Uh, our constituents should be told the absolute truth when it comes to 311 requests. If folks are willing to take the time out of their day to report their concerns, the city agencies should be accountable with, the in, in, uh, with an informative uh, information or um, the truth. Uh, this is exactly what government ought to be about. Like I mentioned, NYPD not responding truthfully for years, folks, for years. And um, as a civic leader, 
uh, over and over again. We, we had to call the precinct. Then finally, when I uh, re would report to the Department of Sanitation uh, a problem, let's say um, a zombie house filled with all over the front yard litter. I put in a number of requests and I didn't put my name sometimes on it because I wanted to see what would happen. So as a civic leader, they knew me. So if I put my name, they would act truthfully. They would respond, okay, yes, we ticketed the, uh, the zombie house. When I didn't put my name in, um, no ticket. They said an agent responded and didn't see a problem. So there's something going on here. I think we need to really get to the bottom of it, and this bill, I hope, does. And I, I would like to hear how we can get truthful response from these agencies um, from, the, from the panel here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. I want to ask uh, the committee council to please uh, swear in the witnesses today. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. I believe we're gonna start with uh, Mr. Morris Rowe, and then we're probably gonna uh, go down from the different agencies. So uh, thank you very much for being here this morning. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Joe Morris Rowe. I am the Executive Director of New York City 311. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I will address the bill being heard before this committee and will then turn it to the individual agencies to provide testimony on their 311 response operations. You will hear from the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Buildings, the Department of Finance, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department of Transportation, Housing Preservation and Development, and the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Introduction 1002 by Council Member Holden would require the 311 Customer Service Center to indicate that an agency is unable to respond to a service request or complaint. Let me begin by giving a bit of background. The creation of the 311 system was specifically built to have a closed loop process so customers may know the result of their issue, um, sorry, the issue they report based on the individual agency assigned to the request. As you will hear today, Service requests have a wide range of service level agreements, or SLAs, which is the time frame an agency is expected to respond for a particular issue. Some SLAs are as short as an hour, while others can span for several days, depending on the severity to public safety. 311's role is to communicate that information to the customer and provide an expectation on when the service request will be fulfilled. As such, 311 is unable to follow an agency's workflow process for each of the three million service requests that are filed yearly and accurately provide a disposition for a service request that has not been marked as closed. We rely on our agencies to do that. Introduction 1002 would drastically change 311's operations and would not allow it to fulfill its role of providing New Yorkers with the information they seek or help them submit and monitor their service requests. For these reasons, we cannot support the bill's intent in its current form. At this point, I will turn it to Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach from the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. I'm Michael Deloach, Deputy Commissioner for Public Affairs at the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about DEP's response to 311 complaints. DEP protects the environment and public health by providing high quality drinking water, managing wastewater and stormwater, and reducing air noise and hazardous materials pollution. Due to the scope of our operation, DEP responds to more than 200,000 311 complaints a year. DEP has a large and sophisticated 311 response system in place to ensure that every complaint is responded to. DEP has 123 unique complaint types in the 311 system, which fall into 11 different complaint categories. The 123 complaint types are categorized as either priority or non-priority complaints. 26 of our complaint types are priority, meaning that they must be responded to within 24 hours. Some responses, like a chemical spill, must be responded to within an hour. Non-priority complaints, like damaged curb pieces, may be responded to within a few days. All 311 calls forwarded to DEP are automatically routed to the appropriate response bureau within the agency. 
Priority complaints are simultaneously sent to the Emergency Communication Center, which is staffed 24-7. Upon receiving the priority message, staff at the ECC contact our on-call staff who immediately respond to the complaint. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the department's response to 301 complaints. The department takes very seriously its obligation to respond to every complaint that it receives. In fiscal year 2018, the department received nearly 102,000 301 complaints. The department triages its complaints based on the severity of the alleged conditions. As such, the department has established nearly 100 unique complaint categories, each of which is assigned a priority. The department's top priority is responding to complaints that allege serious safety issues. This includes structural instability, failure to safeguard construction sites, accident response, and work occurring without a permit from the department. These complaints are categorized as priority A and priority B complaints. The department also responds to lower priority complaints, which capture violating conditions that, if occurring, while serious, do not present an immediate threat to the public. The department responds to complaints expeditiously. In fiscal year 2018, the department responded to nearly 16,500 priority A complaints. While the department's target to respond to these complaints is 24 hours, such complaints are generally responded to within nine hours of receipt and within two hours for the most serious cases. The department also responded to approximately 75,000 priority B complaints. While the department's target to respond to these complaints is 40 days, such complaints are responded to within 11 days, down from over 40 days four years ago. Additionally, the department responded to nearly 33,000 lower priority complaints. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. My name is Sheila Feinberg, and I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Department of Finance. Thank you for this opportunity to testify about DOF's processes for responding to 311 service requests. DOF maintains a close working relationship with our partners at 311. We share information with each other in real time in order to empower 311 to respond to most inquiries at the point of first contact. This is essential, especially important to DOF due to the high volume of DOF related calls that 311 receives. In fiscal year 2018, 311 received 1,021,918 calls about DOF matters and was able to resolve up to 87% of them during the call. Our partnership with 311 increases the quality of the customer service that we provide and helps the public get the information they need as quickly and easily as possible. Our staff is in contact with 311 on a daily basis. Both 311 and DOF monitor call volume and adjust the information given to the public in real time to respond to the types of inquiries that are trend trending. DOF prepares 311 in advance of all mailings and public initiatives to ensure that the agents have the information necessary to respond to the public's questions. When 311 is not able to resolve the matter at first contact, DOF accepts and responds to service requests. In fiscal year 18, we received 63,318 service requests from 311, which accounts for 6% of the total DOF-related call volume to 311. Service requests are addressed by individual business units in the order they are received. Last year, DOF received 39,445 requests for copies of documents, forms, and other printed materials, and the average turnaround time to respond was one day. The average length of time to close our service requests agency-wide was 10 days. In total, DOF closed over 96% of all service requests received in fiscal year 18. Overall, 67% of service requests were closed within their service level agreement, or SLA, in fiscal year 2018. DOF is already making strides to improve this number. Through the first half of fiscal year 19, 74% of service requests have been closed within their SLA. In many cases, our first response to response to the customer is within the service level agreement, even if we are not able to fully resolve the issue and close the service request. In summary, we continue to prioritize customer service. It's one of our four pillars. We strive to give our customers the information they need as quickly as possible by working with 311 and responding to service requests. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and, and members of the committee. 
I am Jeff Hunter, Assistant Commissioner for Environmental Health Administration at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Thank you for inviting us here to testify on how we respond to 311 service requests. New Yorkers can use 311 to file complaints and other service requests for DOHMH to enforce provisions of the New York City Health Code with a wide scope, including rodent infestations, food safety, smoking, water safety, as well as other environmental conditions that may cause injury or illness. New Yorkers can also use 311 to ac access general public health information, like information on infectious disease outbreaks and product contamination. New Yorkers can also be connected to healthcare services like sexual health clinics, health insurance enrollment centers for 311 inquiries that require discussion of confidential health information, like accessing birth and death certificates. Callers are routed to the DOHMH call center where trained customer service representatives can help them with their inquiry. In 2018, 311 received 320, over 320,000 inquiries and over 66,000 service requests for DOHMH. While we strive to respond to all complaints we receive in a timely manner, our response protocol prioritizes complaints based on the threat to public health alleged in the complaint. For serious allegations, we may respond with an immediate inspection of the site. For lesser public health threats, we may respond within three days. And for less severe allegations, we may send a warning letter to the operator or business owner requesting that they eliminate the condition or the department will take action. Our most common complaints are rodent complaints. In 2018, DOHMH received over 30,000 rodent-related service requests. When a New Yorker files a rodent complaint through 311, it is routed to DOHMH for assignment and review. All rodent complaints are routed for an unannounced inspection unless they are duplicates of a complaint already scheduled for an inspection. Our target time frame for inspection is within 10 business days, and in FY18, fiscal year 18, we met that expectation in 81% of cases. After a service request is resolved, DOHMH staff update our internal complaint tracking system with the case resolution. That data is then copied to the citywide reporting system controlled by DOIT. When a New Yorker files a 311 rodent complaint, they are informed that all inspection outcomes are available on 311. This information is available on the open data grouped by property, which is especially helpful for New Yorkers because they can see what other rodent complaints and inspections have occurred. DOHMH is committed to prompt and transparent response to all inquiries and complaints, and thank the Council for their partnership in helping to protect and improve the health of all New Yorkers. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. I am Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs at the New York City Department of Transportation. Thank you for inviting us to testify on city agency responsiveness to 311 service requests. With 6,000 miles of street and 12,000 miles of sidewalks, 14,000 signalized intersections, 300,000 streetlights, over a million signs, 14,000 muni meters, and 69 million linear feet of markings to safely and efficiently manage and always in need of continu excuse me, continuing attention, DOT makes up a sizable portion of 311 service requests. Detectives, defective streetlights, potholes, signals, other street conditions, sidewalk conditions, broken meters, and missing or dangling signage are among our top requests in that order. Our first goal is to make safe any dangerous condition. In the case of traffic signals, for example, in addition to receiving complaints, our own system will alert us to an issue, and for the fourth fiscal year in a row, we have, had, we have exceeded our performance target of two hours to make safe. In the case of signage, we prioritize any sign that is dangling, regulatory signage, or any or an intersection without at least one sign to identify the main or cross street for emergency services and continue to meet our performance target for replacing high priority regulatory signage with less, within less than two business days for the fifth year running. Let me address one of our most common complaints, potholes. With the de Blasio administration's record level of resurfacing, the number of potholes we have, we have had to fill in the most recent fiscal year was down almost 40% since 2014, and our average response time is down to three and a half days for FY18, after which the case is closed. In addition, we address conditions identified by our own crews and arrange our work routes for efficiency. In fact, 
for the most recent fiscal year, about half of all our jobs were proactive rather than in response to a request. In summary, DOT appreciates the public assistance as our eyes and ears to report maintenance issues when they see them, responding to urgent issues is a top priority for our agency, as well as the upkeep and maintenance of the vital in infrastructure on which New Yorkers rely to ensure safety, ensure safe, efficient mobility for all. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Mallory, and I'm the Chief of Staff for Government Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the invitation to testify on the critical steps HPD is taking to respond to 311 complaints in a timely and effective manner. HPD aggressively enforces the city's housing maintenance code by responding to complaints, conducting inspections, and issuing violations. Our goal is to respond with an inspection as quickly as possible to every 311 complaint about housing maintenance conditions, especially those with serious health or safety circumstances. In fiscal year 2018, we attempted more than 700,000 inspections and issued more than 522,000 violations in response to complaints, including 580,000 311 service requests, observed conditions by inspectors, and proactive inspections initiated by HPD. With over 150 complaint types in the 311 system relating to HPD maintenance service requests, we further categorize them into non-hazardous, hazardous, or immediately hazardous complaints based on the severity of the reported conditions. Upon receipt of a complaint, HPD will attempt to contact a building's managing agent immediately to advise them that a complaint has been filed and that a violation may be issued if the condition is not corrected. HPD will also attempt to call the tenant to see if the condition was corrected, and if so, HPD will close the complaint. If not, HPD will send a code inspector within a time frame dependent on the severity of the complaint. There are also more than 20 information request types which HPD staff attempt to fulfill in an expedient manner, including requests for the ABCs of housing, HPD's guide to housing rules and regulations for owners and tenants. <clears throat> to give an example, HPD responds to heat and hot water complaints as quickly as possible. Every year, heat season officially begins on October 1st and runs through May 31st in response to the colder weather. Residential building owners are required by law to maintain indoor temperatures at 68 degrees when it falls below 55 degrees outside during the day and a minimum of 62 degrees indoors overnight, regardless of outdoor temperatures. Building owners are also legally required to provide hot water at 120 degrees year-round. In heat season FY18, HPD received over 210,000 complaints for heat and hot water. Despite this high volume of complaints, our code inspectors were able to reach residents within three days. So far, in this current heat season, we have received over 131,000 heat and hot water complaints, and they've been able to reduce that response time by one full day so that our code inspectors are reaching residents within two days. We are constantly working to get to residents even quicker whenever possible. Our non-emergency complaints, which can range from low water pressure to the cleanliness of a garbage storage area, have slightly longer response times for inspections. I want to give a special thanks to our code inspectors who brave polar vortexes and blistering heat to ensure that New Yorkers are living in safe, quality housing. Customer service and our everyday interactions with tenants are important to HPD, and we strive to respond to every request as soon as possible. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Cabrera, and members of the committee. I am Mark Lee, Assistant Commissioner of Licensing and Standards at the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. The core of TLC's mission is to regulate and license almost 130,000 medallion taxi cabs for hire vehicles including community-based liveries, black cars, and luxury limousines, commuter vans, paratransit vehicles, and nearly 200,000 TLC licensed drivers, as well as the businesses that support them. TLC licensed drivers perform over 1 million trips every day. And with all these trips, 311 receives a significant number of lost property reports, consumer complaints, and other service requests. I want to give a brief overview of how TLC processes and responds to requests received through 311, starting with lost and found. When a passenger reports property left inside a yellow or green taxi, the passenger and trip information go into 311's system. The customer next receives an automatic email informing them that their case has been assigned along with a TLC employee's name and phone number assigned to the case. This usually occurs the same day or next day. TLC staff will attempt to locate the driver, vehicle, or garage 
using TLC trip data and licensee records, but may need to contact the passenger for additional information, such as clarifying the drop-off time and location. Once the driver is identified, staff will facilitate conversations between passengers and licensees so that the property can be returned. Staff closes the record and through in one system once the search has been completed or if they are unable to proceed without further information and haven't heard back from the passenger. If passengers contact TLC after a case has been closed, TLC staff will reopen the investigation and continue to pursue, per, continue to pursue the lost property search. The whole process usually takes no more than two to three days. Turning to complaints filed against a TLC licensee, TLC's prosecution unit completes daily imports from 311 system into TLC's Electronic Summonsing and Administration Program, or ESAP. Immediately thereafter, correspondence is generated to the complainant acknowledging the receipt of their complaint and stating that TLC is investigating the incident and will keep them informed throughout the process. If the TLC investigation finds evidence of a TLC rule violation, they will move forward with a case against the licensee. If, however, the investigation determines that no violation occurred, the complainant will be notified that TLC is unable to prosecute their complaint. In all cases, TLC prosecutors are available by telephone or email to discuss their complaint and answer any questions complainants may have. These 311 requests are closed out only after the complaint is resolved, including if TLC declines to prosecute the complaint, if a driver settles, or if the case is decided by oath after a hearing or appeal. Compliments and agency issues are small in volume and comprise the remainder of TLC 311 requests. TLC's external affairs unit reviews compliments and often prepares commissioner letters thanking TLC licensees for providing stellar service. Agency issues are reviewed and responded to by the TLC correspondence team. Matters requiring additional information are forwarded to other units for investigation. Requests are closed when a, respondent has been, a response has been communicated to the customer. TLC is committed to having adequate controls over its processing of 311 requests. Working together, we can continue to further this commitment. And on behalf of all the agencies here today, we thank you for the opportunity to testify. At this point, we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Assistant Commissioner Lee. Uh, thank you all for being here. I want to start. Uh, my first question is a basic one. It's for each of you. Uh, will you commit today to providing more regular status updates on 3 service requests and to closing out complaints when they are complete? Would everyone agree to that? I think that's a goal we're always striving for, so yeah, I think yes. we could all agree. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so to throw in one, Mr. Morsro, is there a technical barrier that is preventing agencies from providing more thorough information regarding resolution descriptions? If there is, how can we resolve that? There are a couple of steps involved in transmitting information from agencies back to 311, uh, but I would not say there is a technical barrier that exists today. So then how come when I uh, gave my opening statement, how come we have so many vague resolution um, issues uh, from some agencies more than others. We, we applauded sanitation, but we also talked about with the uh, Department of Health and with DOT how uh, there are still significant issues on those resolutions. Why, why, does it, why is there such a large delta from agency to agency? I'm not sure what, uh, why there would be a large delta. I'm not familiar with the specifics of the examples. If there were a barrier, as you mentioned before, of passing the data from an agency back through the system to the 301 system, uh, we could take a look at that and address that and understand why. If it's uh, beyond that, I wouldn't be able to speak to that and would defer to my colleagues at the city agencies to reference that. Well, if, uh, and, and correct me if I'm reading this wrong, if you look at the, the chart, that the council uh, put together, you see some agencies with uh, very few ambiguous issues related to service requests. So TLC has very, very few. But then if you go over to the Department of Finance, 74% of cases 
are ambiguous. So there is a very wide difference from agency to agency where there's an ambiguous resolution or where there isn't. And it's through on one analyzing these data sets from agency to agency and figuring out why certain agencies are better at resolving it while other agencies still have a large, outstanding, ambiguous resolution. First, forgive me for twisting around to see the screen and turning away. Uh, let me answer your last question first. Uh, 3 one does not uh, analyze and, and analyze and go through these uh, agency responses and updates. Uh, it, our core competencies are really focused on customer service, intake and referral process, and making sure New York City government information and services are accessible to all New Yorkers. Uh, we do not do um, a monitoring or an evaluation function uh, on service request responses. I mean, I understand that, but that's also a problem. If you are the, the agency that people are coming to to make complaints, there needs to be some level of data cleanup or quality assurance that's being done uh, in checking to see that the information that you're providing, since you're the portal for people to go get a status update on their request, if one agency has very low uh, issues related to ambiguous resolutions and others don't, you would think that your agency would want to figure out why that is and work with the individual agencies to see if there's a way to have greater transparency and uniformity across the board. It, it would be strange if one day I woke up and had a sanitation complaint and made that sanitation complaint and I got a very good response and I was able to track it and it wasn't ambiguous. But the next day I went to another agency, whether it's on this chart, the Department of Finance, and for a long period of time it was ambiguous. I, in many instances, I'm probably not blaming that individual agency. I'm probably blaming through on one. I'm probably saying, well, why is through on one presenting this to me this way? So how would you respond to that? Um, one of the things we do is put a very uh, focused effort and robust effort on making sure the intake process for complaints is accurate. Uh, the agencies have a number of requirements for data collection. Uh, that we need to get right, whether the customer is talking to an agent in the call center or whether the customer is self-serving through the online or perhaps through the mobile app, uh, making sure that uh, the fields and the values in those fields are captured correctly, making sure the correct complaint type is captured and the descriptor associated with that complaint type is corrected. Basically, the, the accuracy of that intake is what we do focus on. Uh, we also then work with the agencies on a regular basis. We have a staff that interacts with city agencies, as my colleagues mentioned here, um, in most cases at these agencies, on a daily basis on policies and programs and sharing information. Uh, what we do not have is a focus or, uh, or, or sizing or sourced to be able to understand the inner workings of an agency and what a response, what type of response A is versus response B. Uh, that they would provide back for a particular complaint. Before we go to DOF, I just I just want to say, have you seen this chart before, Mr. Morsrow? Uh, I have not seen this particular chart, no. So, I mean, I, and I, I don't say this in a, um, really, what I'm about to say, I don't say it in any way to, because I think you do a great job. And um, I've been impressed with how our team has worked with you and understanding the work that you do. But I would say that, um, you know, I know the mayor's uh, office has a mayor's office of data analytics who do a great job, um, but our data team similarly was able to pull this information and, and where we have found, I think, some inadequacies uh, or uh, some issues across the board, we would be happy to work with you all and figure out ways to be sort of more responsive as it relates to the the chart that we're seeing today and ways potentially worth your own one to creatively figure out uh, in a way that doesn't require a huge amount of um, new personnel, but what are some systematic ways to uh, have through on one work agency by agency to have some more uniformity and to make sure that the level of responsiveness um, and transparency and non-vagueness uh, can be more aligned. 
Uh, I welcome that, Speaker, and I, and I thank you for that. One of the things that 301 has done over the years and really just over the last five years, as I mentioned in previous testimony, uh, we've doubled the number of customer contacts from 20-something million to 44 million customer contacts last year. One of the reasons for that is uh, working closely with and accepting feedback and working closely with partners. Uh, the head of Mayor's Office of Data Analytics and I are going to be working on information along these lines. So I appreciate your offer and, and we'll take you up on that. Great. So uh, DOF, roughly, as I said, uh, uh, Sheila, who I like very much, it's good to see you. Hi, Speaker. 74% um, of complaints handled by DOF include ambiguous resolutions updated to quote, we have researched your claims. How do we know what DOF actually did to resolve the complaint? Why is the number that high? Well, DOF is dealing with very sensitive matters, your property taxes, your parking tickets. So our response is on an individual basis. So one, that means we don't have a carte blanche answer. That's why we say something like, we've researched your case. In the notes field, we provide more information on the resolution of that case, but that might not be reflected in the data that you're looking at right now. But that's the explanation that I can provide right now. Is there a way, uh, th that makes sense, uh, but is there a way, it still doesn't look good, and, and it still seems like there could potentially be a better way to, while still maintaining privacy related to the individual concerns, to come up with categories that are st slightly more descriptive, not as ambiguous, and provide more information while still maintaining the level of privacy required for sensitive uh, concerns related that DOF may have. Sure, I think that's something that we're open to exploring and to maybe we just have more options in the drop down menu that we provide back to 311. Okay, great. So the, back to the TLC, if you go to the TLC uh, chart, you see that 99% of cases are still ongoing. That doesn't, why is that? We would, we would certainly love to see the, uh, the data behind this um, to explore this further. Just um, from our perspective, uh, I believe you mentioned that um, the 99 percent saying ongoing indicates something along the lines that uh, someone will contact the complainant within 14 days. Um, that is certainly an indicator of a, a an, an early action, an early update, progress update that we provide to let people know that we have received the update. Um, from our agency's perspective, um, there is a lot of action that is certainly occurring beyond that. And to consider, we're not sure if those should be necessarily considered closed, which is why we would love to look into that more, but um, uh, we do want to look into this further and be able to provide more description to remove this particular piece of ambiguity. So again, if you look at the, the slide we have on vague responses, uh, no, if you go back down to where we were before, the, the chart, nope, the chart that you were just at on vague responses. Yep, right there. So it says uh, TLC and DOHMH uh, nearly all of the complaints are considered closed, but the resolution descriptions imply an ongoing case. Again, you just said it, uh, Mark, that um, the TLC will contact you within 13 days to confirm your complaint details. Please note your service request number for future reference. And then while these complaints may have been addressed, there's no way to know based on the stated resolution because the actual resolutions are never posted. So you'll look into this with us, you'll work with us, and figure out a way for there to be something more transparent and responsive. Absolutely, and we are proactively communicating to complainants about how pr cases are proceeding through, but we do need to get that reflected uh, into the public through uh, the open data portal. We certainly agree with that. So DOHMH, why are 20% of rodent complaints dated in a way that the complaints are resolved or closed before they're actually filed with 3-on-1. I mean, this is a 3-on-1 issue as well. If you see this, if you're doing some level of data quality, uh, quality assurance, data cleanup, that doesn't make any sense. How could 20% of the complaints be dated in a way that they're closed before they were ever filed? So how would 3-on-1, how would DOHMH respond to that? It's very confusing for someone if you go to the website and that's what it says. Right, I, I do agree it's a little confusing. Um, so we can work to improve this. Uh, the issue is related to the parent record of, let's say it's a property that's being addressed um, in a larger scale by our uh, rodent inspectors. They, the date that's updated in 311 refers back to 
potentially, if we were there three days prior um, and issued a five-day letter and then a complaint was made, um, the original date of that complaint might be, that, that's what's put in 311. I think we can improve that in 311 to have it uh, reflect to that complaint and not to the parent record because when we, when we address um, rodent infestations or rodent complaints, they're at a, lar they're at a property scale. Um, so it's referring to the parent complaint. Um, but we can improve that. Uh, again, I don't say this, I'm not saying this to be critical of you. I, I don't even understand what you just said. Not because you didn't explain it well, sure. but just because that's so confusing. Absolutely. And, and I wanna just move on to, to DOT. Okay. Um, so for DOT, again, I said it, Rebecca, 46% of all complaints. If we can go to the DOT, oh, here it is, right here. 46% of uh, all complaints received by DOT uh, given a resolution description. It directs individuals to research that service request status on the DOT website. Right. So you, you can put your service request into the DOT website and get a more, and get a more robust update. How does that make sense? What I'm saying here, the point I'm trying to make, Understood. going agency by agency by agency, is, and a through on one, stop the insanity. There has to be a better way. There has to be a, a more user-friendly, more transparent. There has to be a more user-friendly, more transparent way where it's not ad hoc, agency by agency, I mean, the staff here at the council's very good, and they did a lot of work preparing for this hearing, but they haven't been preparing for three months. They've been preparing for a month or a few weeks, and they've been able to find all of these deficiencies. And as Councilmember Holden said, uh, you could talk about the NYPD issues, they're not here. You could talk about sanitation issues, even though they're good at the vague response stuff, there's still issues with sanitation. Agency by agency, there are issues. So, um, Mr. Morsro, uh, there needs to be some, I don't know whether it's some internal working group, whether it is some uh, multi-level um, intergovernmental task force, whether it's with the city council, the, the agencies that you work with, the mayor's office of data analytics, uh, do it, whoever, to come together and say, here where the, the gaps exist. Here are the ways that we could fix those gaps, because ultimately I would think that your goal and our goal, the city's goal, to have through on one is to be responsive, to be transparent, to get people the information that they need, to do it in a way where they're not banging the head against the wall or the computer because they have to go from through on one to then the DOT website or they don't understand why the rodent complaint is closed before it was filed or why 99% of TLC complaints are considered ongoing. I could keep going. That's not a user-friendly way to run a system. And so I would love to hear any ideas that you may have or some level of commitment to look at what we put together and to try to figure out a way to improve this. I can certainly provide the level of commitment here and now. Uh, I'm certain as we speak, some of my staff are already researching this in real time. Um, and we will work with the agencies here. Some of these items are known items. Um, looked at over in, in the past, some of these we will take into consideration as part of the upgrade to the new 311 system which uh, will be uh, which something that is in progress now. Uh, as some folks may know, the existing system, as well as the interfaces with city agencies, is approaching 16 years, and we're rolling into a new one. So the work done by council staff, by others, by agencies that have been identified here, we'll certainly take that and work with them collectively. You also mentioned, as, as did I, the Mayor's Office, Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, who I think can be a, a strong ally in, in looking at this and helping us with everything from best practices to uh, a fresh set of eyes in terms of looking at data. And so when a complaint, thank you for that, Mr. Morris. When a complaint is initially directed to the wrong agency by three and one, that happens. You get so many complaints that mistakenly, uh, you know, you may think a sinkhole is a pothole because of potentially what the person on the phone is saying. And so it could go to DOT when it should go to DEP because sinkholes go to DEP and potholes go to DOT. Uh, do you transfer the complaint to the new agency? 
when you realized that there was, it was sort of mischaracterized? I could speak to one of two steps in the process. On the front end, we do put extra care into trying to identify that, as you said, but it's not always clear to the customer uh, and could be, one could be described as the other. Um, I do believe, and I'd have to defer to my agency colleagues, that there is an ability of a reassign process uh, that happens uh, in those particular cases, oh, sorry, in the particular case that you mentioned, but I would have to defer to the agency to so, confirm that. So if it does get reassigned, yeah. If the reassignment is made to the correct agency based off of information you got, you realize that um, as you were going to resolve the complaint, the agency it was assigned to says, that's not us, it's this sister agency, and you make the reassignment, does the new agency then take over inside the system, and are they then responsible for updating the complaint until it's resolved? Yeah, I, I'm not certain of the detail on that. Okay. so. Rebecca? Yeah, do you want, okay, so this is how we do sinkhole, cave in, that kind of. Uh, I wasn't speaking specifically about sinkholes, oh, okay. but I'm happy to but know. I mean, I'm happy to hear the example. But I have bullets. Okay, okay. I'm happy bullets. to hear the but example. I have bullets, yeah. so I think that's helpful. Okay. So since 2009, all cave in complaints that used to go to DEP were rooted to DOT HIQA. HIQA stands for Highway Inspections and Quality Assurance. HIQA inspects the location, and if it's in fact a cave in, then we'd issue what's called a corrective action request to DEP and close the complaint. If it's a pothole, we fix it. Um, after receiving the car, DEP conducts an investigation and then they can make the repairs if it's a city line problem or issue a three-day notice to the owner or house, uh, utility company, or give it to one of their emergency con contractors if it's a serious break. Um, but but we, just on that, yes. you, you said you closed the case. Correct. Why? The case isn't closed. Why does it get transferred? Well, I mean, I think because if it's a pothole, we're going to address it in less than four days, and I no. But what I'm saying, yeah, right. But, I don't have a. But if you go, if it, it gets assigned yeah, to DOT because it's a point. sinkhole, yep, right. yep. It should be it should be reassigned within the system. So then DEP just takes it over, and it says in the system transferred to DEP. And then people know, okay, I don't have to talk, I don't have to, talk to DOT anymore. I'm going to go to um, Michael Deloach's shop and work with them on resolving the complaint. I'm just trying yeah. to get to the point. Yeah. Understood. There are, there are better ways to do this for the public. There are, there are kind of more user-friendly, more transparent ways so that people can track things in an easier way. Okay, I'm gonna, just going to end with, with this um, and then turn it back over to, to Chair Cabrera. Um, <clears throat> I'm really glad we've had these two hearings uh, because, again, the, the sort of secret shopper calls that we had here at the Council of the 301, most of them went really, really well. I mean, the, the, the 301 operators who answered the phone were very engaged, very thorough, very dedicated most of the time would not let us off the phone. We wanted to get off the phone. They were being so thorough. So today, again, th these two hearings are in no way uh, an indictment on through and one. You guys do an incredible amount of work with such a high volume, and we're grateful for that. But it's also about the real deficiencies that we uh, have been able to point out through the, the limitations of the app, uh, that we talked about in the previous hearing, needing that updated. We know that there's a plan to do that, and you all talked about that with Do It at the previous hearing. And then today, looking at doing this in a data-driven way, looking at agency by agency, which agencies are doing a really good job, which agencies, uh, it's hard to know if they're doing a good job because the data is sort of ambiguous and it's hard to for us to fully analyze that, and kind of just taking a really in-depth, detailed look on, on what we all can do to make through on one better for New Yorkers um, who call in. What, what we don't want to happen, and this is I think why it's so important to have this hearing and to figure out next steps to improve all this, you know, if people lose trust, they stop trying. They stop calling through on one because they think, I'm not gonna get information that's helpful to me, so why am I making the complaint? And so whatever we can do to give people that trust, to show them that it's being tracked in the appropriate way, that it's being handled in the appropriate way, that it makes sense, that we don't make them jump through rings and hoops by go to the DOT website instead of getting the 
um, updated email or being able to plug the complaint number directly into the 311 website or app, we don't want to make people switch over to another website. Uh, we want them to be able to get it in the website that they're in, that they made the complaint in. So that is why I think it's really important in this moment that we're in as 311 is going through the process of uh, building out new capabilities, looking at the app, looking at the website, investing a significant amount of time and money into doing that. While that process is happening, we are happy to give you all of our data, point out the areas that we think could be done better, and hopefully, whoever the point people are, agency by agency, putting together some working group to be able to look and see what the issues are to create greater uniformity across the board so that it makes sense if a New Yorker is making a complaint. So I'm really grateful, Mr. Morrisro, for, uh, for you being here uh, for this second hearing, for uh, your working with us and preparing for these hearings, for your dedication to the city with the high volume of complaints that you're working on. And I look forward to this being a collaborative process with the council, with all the agencies that we get to work with on a daily basis to help our constituents, and with you because the vital lifeline that you provide to New Yorkers on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and I'd like to just say thank you also for acknowledging in the kind words on the women and men at 311 who do try, strive to do the best every day, and we appreciate that, and we share the same goals, and I look forward to working with you. So we're going to we'll probably come back a year from now and have another hearing like this, another maybe two hearings like this, if Chair Cabrera is open to it, and to, and to say, what have you done in a year? What, what has been done over the course of a year, given all the information we talked about today, given the, all the information we talked about two weeks ago, where are we? And so that's why I think it's probably important to convene a group that will probably meet, hopefully meet regularly over the course of the year so that we come back, we're like, wow, you've done, you guys have done an amazing job at resolving this. Thank you all very, very much. I also want to thank you all who, um, each one of you has been very helpful to my district office and to me personally when I've had issues with your individual agencies. You all have been total professionals um, to work with and I'm deeply grateful to your service and the work you do every single day. And with that, I want to turn it over to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you for uh, your leadership regarding the 301 service uh, requests. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, that we've been joined by Council Member Ben Kalos, Powers, Yeager, Holden, Perkins, and myself. Uh, I have a few questions. I want to turn it over to, uh, after that, just a couple of questions. I know uh, my colleagues uh, have questions, and I want to give them an opportunity. I, I'm just curious to know uh, if there are any coordination uh, between uh, yourself and government operations at City Hall regarding all the follow-up data, uh, the operating systems, and, w and if you could speak about the nature of it. Uh, sure, 311 you're referring to? Yes. Okay, then I'll uh, take that. Uh, First off, thank you for the question. And uh, yes, 311 actually coordinates with not only our city agencies. I, I mentioned earlier there is um, uh, a small staff that interacts with each city agency. Uh, we also work closely with um, Mayor's Office of Operations, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, we work closely with Do It on the technology side, and then other agencies, as whether they be uh, not represented necessarily here, but uh, we have a conduit into uh, both City Hall staff, uh, Mayor's Office of Operations staff, I should say as well as all agencies, and we work with them. Do you have uh, an internal alert system that goes to the agencies, they're established, uh, the, you know, the preferred due date when a response should take place, so let's say it's four days. Uh, is there an alert that is automated that goes back to them and say, hey, the four day have expires, uh, you know, it could be color coded from you know green, yellow to red, uh, just to you know just to give the alert that there is no you know response. Okay. You mean an alert within 311 system? Yes. No, we do not have that. Is that something you're looking forward to integrating your new system that you're going to be rolling out in July? That's not included in the in the current view of the new system. No. Okay. Would that be something that you see in the future as profitable? Uh, to the agencies to give them a uh, proper alert system? 
reminder. I think it's something we could take a look at with agencies and see what it would take to do and, and what the value of that would be. Is that something that I, you know, I'm just going to ask overall to the agency that would be helpful to the agencies? This is Mark from TLC. I'll say that, based on my understanding of the new system, um, the ability to, if nothing else, hone in on those service requests that are approaching a due date or past a due date, um, the, the new system will allow, allow us to do that much more easily, kind of at the ground and supervise the level. So we're, we're certainly looking forward to that capability. Uh, do you, uh, do your, uh, this is an overall question to every one of you. Do you check the open data portal uh, for data? Because that's where we got our uh, data from. And I noticed in your testimonies and a few of you, there was, you know, there was lacking um, data in terms of your response some of you did a really good job at it. Uh, some of you, it was, it was like a wall. Uh, so I'm just curious: as is that something that uh, you look at your agencies? And if so, why it was not in your briefing today? So speaking on behalf of TLC, um, to for for data on our service requests that come in, how we're doing. Um, we have a number of data sources for that, um, including sort of the 301 system itself and a reporting tool. I will say that um, we don't necessarily look at open data per se, but we do have Keep Accurate Track and have a pretty good handle on the number of service requests that come in um, and how long they take to close them out. Okay. Anybody else? Do I need to go one by one? I mean, at DEP, we definitely use the open data portal to do a lot of good work about water quality or asbestos investigator, investigators. We do, we use it often. Okay. And we try and figure out the discrepancies sometimes between our tracking and, and the open data. You're, you're with DEP? Yes. But I didn't see no data here. Well, we have such a wide variety of, of different types of priority, non-priority complaints that it would be hard to sort of go through all. You know, we have air quality monitoring, we have water main breaks, I mean, there's just runs the gamut. So, I mean, I have all the data available, but for the concise testimony, we didn't get into. So, can you all provide us that data that was not included here? I know you were trying to perhaps make your testimony shorter so we wouldn't be here all day. Can we get all that data as to your level? We want to make sure that your data and ours match in terms of uh, how timely your level of responsiveness is uh, to a 311 color. Can, can I have a commitment for all the agencies? Yeah, I mean, for, for DEP, yes. all of our data is on open data portal now, so okay. it's there. Okay. But yes, if there's additional information that you want, we can definitely provide it. Okay, yeah. well, if I, all right, so let me start, if you want me to go with DEP, because what I have here, <laughs> is, and, and tell me if this makes sense, Sure. 42.9 uh, complaints are marked unobserved when a DEP employee investigates. Another 15.5 of the complaints result in no action taken by the agency. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure if that data is, I, I'm not sure I have it broken down like that in front of me. Are you using that from the open data portal? Yes, that's correct. I'm, then it's probably accurate. I mean, it's hard to say. Okay. Uh, I think the data that you are referencing and, and the way this is compiled is new to us. I don't think we've seen it, so it's hard to confirm information that we haven't had a chance to review. Yeah, and just the data that I believe the speaker is asking all the agencies to look at, uh, that way you can make a profit for assessment right. as to your level of response mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the agency. I want to, I know my colleagues have been waiting, so I'm, I'm going to ask the sponsor of the bill, uh, uh, Councilmember Holden, uh, followed by Councilmember Yeager. Um, yeah, I'm just disappointed that NYPD is not here because uh, that's the agency I have the biggest problem with on 311s. Also, um, uh, sanitation. Um, we, we see problems with the uh, reporting sanitation. But I just want to get to a couple of things. Um, who, uh, I reported a, a, a loose manhole cover, and it's, there's nothing more annoying in front of your house than a car is hitting a loose manhole uh, and rattling all night. Now, I reported the DEP. I got an answer. DEP said, well, it's a DOT issue because 
Um, they're claiming, and I, I had called the agency, they're claiming that when the DOT paves the streets that they, the asphalt gets into the, into the rim of the manhole. Uh, so it went back and forth six months. The, the, what happened was they're telling me I have to call DOT and vice versa. And I got back and forth for six months. So, uh, and this is a big complaint um, that we have in, in the neighborhood. So people have given up actually trying to resolve these kind of issues. So um, what, what, what the speaker was saying before about the agency communicating with one another is that, I mean, this was about two years ago. I hope it's gotten better, but somehow I suspect it hasn't. Um, shouldn't the, the, um, the response, let's say if I complain to uh, DEP, shouldn't the response from DEP saying we're, we're reaching out to DOT and vice versa, shouldn't that happen? Yeah, I think there's been a long history of DOT and DEP um, having sort of issues determining exactly who's at cause or, or at fault. We've worked very hard in the past couple of years to have uh, joint inspections uh, to make sure that we're sharing information between agencies. I think we still have, you know, some work to do to make sure that we're not having this frustration, but we definitely have made a lot of advances and we're going to continue to work together to try and alleviate that. Uh, the the specific issue you referenced, I don't know exactly what, you know, how it was handled, but I can say that those are a non-priority fix and as annoying and frustrating as they are for homeowners and residents, um, they do take longer to, to fix. Yeah, I, I understand that. I know it's a non-priority un until you, you're experiencing it yeah. um, and it's quite loud. Uh, right. And yes, but there's been so many others that over the years that we see, and again, it's not the, the uh, agencies represented here so much. Um, maybe um, with the exception of the Department of Buildings, which I had huge problems with from time to time, and we'll talk some more about it, um, where the uh, responding um, agent doesn't see anything wrong. Uh, or if you give them directions that you have to go, this commercial vehicle is parked in a residential driveway at 5 p.m. every day, and they come at 2, two o'clock in the afternoon, even though you put it in the 301 complaint, it's, they didn't actually read it. So we have a lot of situations like that in the neighborhood. People are very frustrated. So I agree with the speaker that we need a, some kind of task force or at least to sit down and work out and tweak this and, and work it out where people will again have faith in the 311 system because in my neck of the woods in, in, in uh, the 30th council district, we have, we have um, we're probably one of the top th uh, uh, quality of life uh, complaint areas uh, in the city of New York where we have, we don't have the big issues, we have the, the, the smaller quality of life, but it seems the agencies that we call most, and it's actually on here, is the NYPD, and that is just, and that's why this, this actually was the, um, the reason why I'm introducing this bill, is really to, to address more toward NYPD um, and the Department of Sanitation because they're, they're just making things up. And I'm, I'm disappointed they're not here. Uh, we have to get them to the table because I like them to explain, and I have photographs, obviously, um, doing this for a long time, where, um, like I mentioned before, you wake up and there's a car park at the hydrant and they're saying it's gone. And I have to call the command, commander of the precinct and say, you know, here's a photograph. You tell me, how, how, do we, how do you explain this? And they don't really have an answer. It's a manpower issue. And the Department of Sanitation actually makes things up because, um, again, I only focus on the zombie houses or the houses that are, are in bad condition. There's litter everywhere, over the pro all over the property. And half the time, the agents don't see anything wrong. So again. Uh, I really don't have a problem so much with the agencies here, and it's, uh, I think it's not a coincidence that NYPD is not here, or neither is sanitation. So um, we have to work the, the, uh, the 311 problems out. It's a great system, I agree with the speaker. It's just people are losing faith in certain complaints that are just going into a, um, you know, a void, and, and they give up, because nothing happens, and it's frustrating. So um, I, we, uh, we, we do have to get th those two agencies, NYPD and sanitation, to the table because, again, that's the inspiration for this bill. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, we've been joined by very important people. Right upstairs, Little Red School House from Greenwich Village. Welcome. <laughs> glad that you're here. Welcome to the City Council. <laughs> uh, I had a question regarding uh, before I, well, that's not my fight. Let's go to Council Member Yeager. I can't have you whole anymore. N no, please. It will be my honor. Well, I hope they're still in the mood to answer your questions after, uh, after mine, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, and also, I would like to add my recognition of the next generation of council members. Thank you very much, and hope we don't bore you too much. Um, folks, I just want to start off with uh, thank you very much for your work. Um, a quick show of hands, if I may uh, ask, has, have any of you been down here to the council to testify on a proposed piece of legislation, either in this council or a previous session of the council? Just raise your hand if yes. Okay. And just keep those hands up for a second. Have any of you ever come before the council and said, the bill that we're hearing today is a good idea. We have no objection whatsoever. Has that ever happened at any time? I know DOT has said yes uh, in the past. They've uh, and DOB, you've said yes, you have. Okay, all right. Well, it's good to hear because um, uh, you know I, my experience here, and I'm only here for a year and thirty something days, uh, has been that uh, no matter what it is that a council member proposes, it's a bad idea. Uh, you know, the agency comes down, a hearing is held 11 months after the bill is introduced, and the first reaction is it's a bad idea. So let's just, let, let me just um, personify that with your own words, Director. Um, introduction 1002 will drastically change 311's operations and will not allow it to fulfill its role of providing New Yorkers with the information they seek or help them submit and monitor their service requests. For, this, for these reasons, we cannot support the bill's intent in its current form. Okay, well, I don't know why you can't support the bill's intent. I, I would hope you mean you can't support the bill as drafted, but surely I hope the intent you can agree with. I'm going to take um, uh, this opportunity, uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, 71 words is the number of words in the statute by Councilman Holden. Uh, excluding the title and the introductory words, and I'm going to read it. If an agency that receives a request for service or complaint through the 311 Customer Service Center is unable to take action on such request for service or complaint, the 311 Customer Service Center shall indicate in the description of the action taken on such request for service or complaint in the 311 computer system that the responding agency is currently unable to respond to the request for service or complaint. 71 words. We probably could have done it in about 30. When we write statutes, we have to say the same word over and over again. That's just the way things work, because um, lawyers get paid by the word. But my point here is that you can't support this bill, because God forbid this bill should become law. It will drastically change 311's operations. And it will not allow you to fulfill the role of providing New Yorkers with the information they seek or help them submit and monitor their service requests. Now, I want to be clear. I want to say something, Director. Um, my complaints about how 311 works, none of them are about how 311 works. I think 311 is great. I really do. I think the people who answer the phones are very helpful. I think they have access to the information. It's the agencies that are failing, not 311. The agencies fail. Ask DOT for a speed bump. Two, three years later, they let you know whether or not you're going to get one. Uh, Department of Finance handles personal account requests, which is why I understand the interaction uh, between Ms. Feinberg and uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, it's not, it's, it, they're in a very different category from all other agencies because really they're talking about people's accounts. And it's really hard to kind of pull a drop down box and indicate how we've handled that. But every other agency, they get, an, they get a request, and well, DOB is very good at going out and writing summonses on people who have illegal signs. That, we get done like that. But every other agency, I can tell you that this morning, I saw uh, at the corner of Bay Avenue and Avenue M, uh, DOT finally addressing a ponding issue that I can tell you that in my 18 years as a community board member prior to my joining this uh, august body, 
we've probably complained for about the last five or six years it's being addressed today. Um, and I know it takes some time, but the speaker's frustration, and uh, he was very kind in how he phrased it, but uh, if I may elaborate a little bit, the speaker's frustration is where an agency gets a request and they look at it and go, well, not our job. That's it, not our job. Where does, well, I don't understand that, and it's not the first hearing I've had on this topic, this not our job thing in government. If I told a constituent that came into my office, not my job, and closed the door, they'd throw me out of office, rightfully. I don't understand how that works. I really don't, this not our job thing, this two, three years to get an answer. As Mr. Speaker said, let's get you guys back here in a year and let us know how you, come back in a month. Come back in a month and tell us how it's fixed. It's, this is the bread and butter of the, of the average New Yorker's frustration with living in this city. Something that you see it on the corner and you say, well, this doesn't look right. There's a wastebasket overflowing on the corner of Avenue M. People throwing their garbage there. We know they shouldn't put their household garbage there, but they do. And it's there and it's overflowing. Hey, you know, I'll take a picture, send it, maybe I'll call 311, call 311. A day or two or three goes by and you clearly see it's not being fixed. None of you are responsible for that. It's not your agency. It's the frustration. And um, I do look at you, Director, because you're 311. But I want to be clear, as I said before, it's not 311. 311 is very good. You're, you're running an incredible portal of information back and forth where you're accepting the information from the, from the New Yorker, you're forwarding on to the agency, and then it falls into a dark hole. <coughs> and then silence. And that's the frustration that I think Mr. Speaker was indicating, and, and that's what led me to join uh, my wise colleague from Queens, um, and he's been doing this uh, uh, a lot longer than I am. I'm older, but he's been doing it a lot longer than I have um, as a civic leader and as a leader of his local community civic organization before his election to the council, but that's really where these <laughs> things come from, right? As a council member, we get paid to do this. It's the people in New York who are like, they see something and they're willing to, to take on that obligation of calling 311 about an overflowing wastebasket, calling 311 because they see a ponding issue or they hear a manhole cover, they see these dangerous things and they ask people to, they ask the agencies to get involved and get the reason. And we're not getting back from, you know what guys, we recognize there's a problem. Our systems are broken, and we're going to work very hard to get 311 the information they need in order to report back to the constituent, and with the goal being, hey, we can fix this in th you know, 30 days. I never, I never hear that we can fix this in 30 days. We can get this done in two weeks. The DOF, they get back to a constituent right away because we're talking about taking their money, right? You can, Constituent calls DOF and says, hey, I got a bill, I don't understand it, I'm not gonna pay it until you guys clarify it for me. That gets, that gets clarified, no problem. But every other agency, we're, all we're asking you to do is, is fix what's broken. I know none of you are actually responsible for fixing a broken thing. You're all uh, uh, legislative and governmental affairs people, none of you are wearing hard hats and out on the street. But somewhere, there's a management problem at every single agency represented here, with the exception of DOF, with the exception of 311. Every single agency here, there is a management problem, a rodent question uh, with, with a 30% fix rate. That's insane to me. I don't understand that. Rodent problem should have a 100% request rate and should have a picture of a dead rat in the response. If we got the rat, here it is, here's a picture. So New York, we're a $90 billion organization. Mr. Chair, I appreciate this. I, I actually don't have a question. I know that's shocking to you. That was my opportunity to tell you folks that I don't believe we should have you back here and reconvene in a year. I believe Mr. Speaker should bring you all back here within a month. And the agencies that are not here today, as, as my colleague from Queens, Mr. Holden, indicated, Department of Sanitation, the Police Department, I think they're great. They have the hardest jobs, literally the two hardest jobs in the city are the guys who grab the garbage, schlep it to the trucks, and the police officers who put themselves in, in harm's way for me and my family. Two hardest jobs in the city. But they also, because they are the two hardest jobs in the city, they have the most interaction with the daily quality of life of the people in New York. It's reasonable to ask for answers uh, to very simple questions. And I understand that when we call 311 and we indicate a DOT problem, and it may not be DOT, but it may be DEP, 
and this ponding issue that I mentioned on Bay Avenue at Avenue M is an issue that has been going on for a long time, but it's not easily rectified. If I could do it, I'd do it myself. Give me some asphalt. I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing. It's not easy. You have to level it out. I understand. It's very difficult. But the notion of closing a case because it's not my job, how could that not be fixed tomorrow? And, and I would just ask you to go back today to the office and say, you know, that, that crazy guy from Brooklyn, once again, is, is letting loose with his microphone, and maybe we can figure out a way that we don't have this again, that, that DOT doesn't close out a complaint because it's not my job. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, you uh, took the words out of my mouth uh, as to what I was going to bring up. Uh, so let me ask the question, uh, because you did make the statement that it will not allow uh, to fulfill its role. So what is it about this bill, can you be more specific, that will not allow you to fulfill your mission? So the 311 mission is, is focused on what I'll call the front end, uh, intake and referral that the councilman referenced in, in his statement. Uh, the give and take between citizens and, and customers, as we call them, and passing that information on to agencies. Um, that's our core competency. That's our front end. Um, that's what our quality scores, our customer satisfaction scores say we do very well. Uh, that's what the volume of contacts to 311 over the years, uh, I mentioned earlier, that it's doubled to, to over 44 million customer contacts over the year. Um, that's the piece we focus on. To shift 311 to serve as some sort of monitor or oversight or, uh, or ensuring compliance um, would, would stretch too far, would stretch beyond 301's ability and take away from its focus. So that's our interpretation uh, of what was being asked of 311 in that particular case. What suggestions you give towards the intent of the bill? Um, I, I take away the suggestions made today by, by the council members, by the speaker, uh, by yourself by my colleagues here at the agencies who, who've shared and answered some of these questions that where data can lead us to find opportunities, we can collectively work on that. And from a 301 perspective, we're, we're very happy to do that. Okay. Uh, let me pass it on to Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. I, I feel that, look, we always can give, take credit. We as a team together for how we've been able to make progress in the city of New York, but there's always gonna be challenges, opportunity on how we can do better. And I feel that 311 is one of those that, you know, we establish it, we create it, we connect New Yorkers to agency that we, they're expected to respond. But the level of frustration is like big. And I can give you a typical sample. And I say, I can say, I believe that I have say like in, three or four hearing, having here those agencies that are responsible, agencies that they've been getting the phone calls, like they are in Washington Heights, San Nicolas Avenue between 180 and 181st. There's a business owner that they take the whole, you remember, the issue is still today, alive. A lot of 311 phone call, NYPD is aware, Inspector, great inspector that we had there in the community. And I say that was a typical sample. Like how, how many feet is that the small, the business owner is supposed to use to be allowed to use in the sidewalk? Anyone knows? But the city law, when someone has business, how many feet are that business owner supposed to be allowed to use? I don't know that off the top of my head, but I can get DCA, because I have been emailing a lot with DCA and sanitation. There have been multiple violations issued to the business that you're talking about. Yeah, and, and, I, and I honestly think it would be best, I know that you're just using it as an example, um, if the multiple agencies who are responsible for the issues that you're talking about, if we all met with you in one but room. It's not, it's not, you know, I understand you that. You know what I mean? It's yeah. nothing, it's, it's what New York is as expected to see for city agency. For me, and of course, great partners with different good issues. But how can we, you know, tell New Yorkers what do we need? Like sidewalks should be for pedestrians. Who should intervene when as today as we're talking right now? And I've been bringing these things in for years. A business owner, as far as I know, they're allowed to use like the three feet. 
I think that they only leave three feet for two pedestrians. And they take like 10. And right now, every day they have a big truck parking the sidewalk where they don't move. And for me, this is about how many phone calls that I, and, and it's not only the council member. I, and, you know, we, will, we work very well together in many issues, but it's a level of federal and frustration. Why should I have a meeting with interagency? Does that mean that the city doesn't have a plan to say when someone has bring obstacles to pedestrian? It should be as an ASAP. Like, what is it? It's like that those people have someone, they know someone that they know that when the NYPD is coming, they get alert and, and therefore they don't get any ticket. So again, but that's a typical sample. And I just bring because it's like two, three years. And as today you send someone, that will be happening there. One train, 181st and San Nicolas Avenue, very heavy for people to walk there. It's a heavily pedestrian use. A lot of 311 phone calls. And that's a typical case of citywide. But when it comes to the 311 as a system, what does it take for us to say when New Yorkers dial 311, we are committed to get back to those New Yorkers who made a call and say the average should not take more than two weeks. Um, when we do receive uh, a customer request and submit it to the agency, uh, there are various time frames that the agencies provide. Each issue could have a different time frame. No, I, I get that part, and I get, and even though I was at the, at the lounge following also the testimony, I saw another different agency respond have different, and it's not a saying if, if the 311 is made because it's something big of the Department of Building or it's something of the NYPD, even though, you know, probably we should say that phone call should be 911, but people, they are more familiar in 311, made the 311. I get it that the response is not a saying as someone who say, there's no heat and hot water in my apartment. How can we work to say there's an average of time that as we had our vision zero and we had a goal, and as we have any other vision, that we can say there's a goal that New York City has that when one, someone made a three-on-one phone call, it would not take more than two weeks. Uh, I'll respond on three-on-one side. Uh, we would work with city agencies to, to pursue and support that. Um, I don't have a, a recommendation for you to answer your question directly. Again, I know what we focus on is setting the expectation with the customer, irrespective of, of a goal of two weeks, on what that time frame is that the agency provides. So, so we partner with the agencies to make sure we're accurately reflecting their time frames yeah. as it varies across different complaint types. And, and I just say that since 311 is a mechanism, basically, you know, the immediate one that people have, the one that we from the elected official can say, if your constituency need help and the office is closed, and if after 6 p.m. or it's a Saturday Sunday, even though we always get to get informed, you know, by from City Hall or the license that we have here, but 311 is the immediate one. I believe that New York City should have the goal, and again, whatever it takes, and, and for the agency to plan together, and we to plan together, and identify the resource, and say it will not take more than two weeks from the moment when someone made a phone call to 311 to respond to that phone call. And my, my other concern that I have that's a suggestion. My other concern that I have, and I can tell you because I live my own experience even as a council member, living at 18 Jacobo's place when I won in 2009 and having my daughters like two years old and no heat at two in the morning and waiting and waiting when the inspector got there, the question at 10 in the morning was, do you have heat? And when the answer was yes, there was no follow up from that complaint. And myself as a council member and other people who know how to navigate and to advocate, we would not take, you know, from the inspectors to come and say, well, do you have heat at 10 in the morning? My issue was not at 10 in the morning. My issue was at 2 in the morning. And I think that those typical things, especially related to housing, to HPD, that happening. That people made the complaint because they didn't have gas, I mean, they didn't have heat 
at 2, 1 in the morning when by law the temperature was so low and the landlord was responsible to provide it. And when inspector get in touch, the media question is, do you have heat? By the 10 a.m., it's not a saying at 2 in the morning. So I hope that, you know, working together at the end, we are in this to work, you know, to fix problem. And I appreciate how many of you have been very accessible to issues that are important for us, to local small business, you know, related to building, to HPD, immigration, and others. But I feel those experiences, I don't think that they only happening in Northern Manhattan. I think that they, well, especially when it comes to HPD, I heard from different people that when they complain for lack of heat in the morning, then later on when they get approached, the question in media is about, do you have heat? And it's 11 a.m., they should be compared to whatever lack of heat people didn't have in the morning. So my suggestion is, again, in that particular case, when you get the information, the complaint from 311, to be able to really, you know, get, in this case, HPD to fix whatever they can do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is, is, uh, which agencies uh, uh, represented today, does it take longer than two weeks to, to make an initial response? For the buildings department, it depends on the severity of the complaint. So mm -hmm. our highest priority complaints are our service level is 24 hours. We get out there within nine, nine hours. Our next level of severity, what we call B complaints, our service level is 40 days. And currently we're getting out there to perform those inspections within 11 days. And then it goes on, it goes further. So for a, a complaint of a very low priority, say someone's fence on their own permanent property is too tall, that's something that might take several, like three months for us to get out there. But again, given the enormous volume of complaints that we receive, we have to appropriately triage those. And so we focus our inspections and our service levels and the timeliness of those inspections on those issues that have the potential to, you know, affect the public imminently. Anybody else? Yeah, I would echo that in terms of the time varies, but if we have a street signal that is out, a, a traffic signal, I mean, like we try to address that in two hours. If you have um, a pothole, it's less than four days. If you someone complains about a street that needs, you know, full capital reconstruction, as you all well know, that, that can take much longer than, than two. But the response, though, so for example, if I'm calling, there is so, a problem, I'll use an example as like yeah. a sidewalk, uh, if someone complains about a sidewalk. Within 30 days, they, um, they get a response from the agency that acknowledges that um, we heard from them. And with 180 days, we are out there making sure that we do an inspection. It, it varies. I mean, we have you know, 12,000 miles of sidewalk. So we, it, it varies, I think, on, on the problem. But I think our goal is to be as responsive as possible. I can't say sitting here knowing all the things that we're responsible for, that our response is always within two weeks. I will say we are always trying to do better with that. So it takes 30 days because? You know, said the I think, manpower? You know, you know, resources, the wow. amount of complaints that we're getting all the time regarding sidewalks. OK. Let me, let me ask you another question in regards to and I know this happens for a fact. If one person calls versus 10 people call, uh, are the 10 calls, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but do you pay more attention uh, and when you have larger volume uh, versus if you have one, just one person calling in? How, yeah. do you, how do you measure that in light of severity? or the lack of severity and the amount of people that are calling in? I think that depends on what the issue is. If 10 people are calling about a broken curb and one person is calling about a traffic signal being out, we're going to prioritize that traffic signal. I, I mean, I get the I mean traffic, maybe others yeah. have other things to say, I, but I understand your rhetoricalness to that. Yeah. It's just, it's. Yeah, for DEP, for noise complaints, if, they're, if we're getting a high volume of calls for a specific location, that will get prioritized above individual complaints. So I mean, I but it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis. So let me give you an example, and I appreciate uh, uh, your examples. Uh, the traffic light, that's a law, uh, actually, which I passed uh, some years ago for Vision Zero. Uh, but in regards to, like, example, potholes, uh, four days. So do you... Uh, if 10 people call versus one people call, does it make a difference? And the reason I'm asking is because 
I, I struggle still with potholes in my district, you know, and I'm, I literally drive through the commissioner, the Bronx commissioner, and we literally walk. And when we do this, uh, every three, four months, we go through it. And because my people keep telling me, they're calling in, and, and I've seen it, even in Burnside Avenue right now. I mean, we, we complained about those potholes a long time ago, and we're still waiting for those uh, potholes <laughs> to be done uh, close to the Sedgwick Avenue. And I know I guess I have to drive through there every time I go to work. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is, is, there, is, is does that, and I, all things given, let's say we're not talking about high severity ones, right? Uh, they're class A for the buildings department. I don't know what your classification uh, spectrums that you have. But if one person call versus 10 people call, uh, and it's one block versus another block in the other side of the Bronx, do you pay more attention? And this is for all the agency. I don't want DLT, because I, 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 I like you. You, you, you answer, you, you're bold to answer questions, but for all the other agencies, it doesn't matter. Finance, I know it's a very individual uh, type of uh, scenarios here, but do you give more attention to uh, the amount of calls that come in for the same kind of problem? I would say generally we do. If there's a high volume, we do prioritize it, depending, again, on the issue, but largely I would say we do. It's you usually do? A, yeah, it's usually okay. symbolic of something, you know, more of an emergency or something, you know, really egregious. So I think that we do, you know, again, okay. case by case is different, but generally we would prioritize a higher volume. Okay. That, anybody else? That kind of confirms what I hear in the streets. Same, the same for everybody. Uh, I'm just going to go through some very specific uh, cases, dead animals. Who handled dead animals? Health Department, likely. Okay. Uh, how many days uh, before uh, the animal is picked up uh, I would from have the point of complaint? I don't know off the top of my head of what our service level agreement is on dead animal pickup, but I can look into that for you. It's days. <laughs> Sorry? Days. And I'm a little baffled with that, you know, that agreement, uh, because, I mean, and that like a health hazard, if you have an animal decomposing and you have children poking at it and, you know. And my colleagues are reminding me that this might also be a sanitation um, complaint. Okay, because so I, I know when my wife called, uh, we had a situation in front of a, uh, church and they said, oh, well, you know, within days, I forgot how many days, but it was days. I'm like, isn't that like, you know, shouldn't we change? How often do you guys look at your service agreement? So within the health department, we, we have varied ways to uh, prioritize our complaints, ranging from immediately to the most severe to 14 days. Um, and, you know, we're continually looking for ways to improve so if there are certain areas where um, we do need to respond in a more immediate manner, we, we can change that. Would you think that that's kind of an immediate kind of uh, action that we should be taking? I, I'd have to loop back with sanitation to find the correct agency that's in charge of, of that specific. But when I call 311 about dead animals, the 311 call gets transferred to who? Depend. Uh, yeah, th that would depend. We would ask you a number of questions about yeah. the type of animal, the location, the possum. situation. And then from there, where is it located? <laughs> a possum. So Let's we, start there. We just, we just did confirm that it is sanitation. It is sanitation. It is sanitation. And they're not here. Correct. Oh, bummer. We're going to have to call them. Uh, it is, you know, if you guys could put an info, because you do deal with health, uh, if you could speak to them, because honestly, uh, by the time, I, if I remember right, uh, I should call 311 and ask. Uh, maybe my staff could call uh, right now, 311. And, uh, but from what I recall, it was like four or eight days. I, I, it's one of those, it, which to me is like, really, this thing is like bloated and flies everywhere, especially in the summer. I mean, it just, we, we gotta do better than that. And since you're the health, 
you wear the health cap in the city if you could communicate to sanitation, uh, then we need to do a better uh, reaction time uh, than that. I don't have any more questions. If my colleagues have any more questions, uh, Councilman Holden. Yeah, I just have a couple. Um, I'd like to ask DOT this question. Um, I get complaints. Uh, we had one um, huge complaint from residents on uh, in, a, in a certain area that their f uh, number of blocks were being paved, except this one dead end was not. And they said, and I got a, uh, an answer from DOT, it's not a map street. And in this day and age, 21st century, it's very hard to believe, and this is, there's no end to this, by the way. It's, you have to put it in, in, a, in a request to get it mapped, and it sometimes takes several years. So these people are out, they're out. They, they can't get their potholes filled, or they can't get the proper maintenance. They, they can't get their street paved. And this is in rough shape. So how do we, how do we move that forward? And, and I want to ask all the agencies, especially DOB, how you offer solutions when you can't gain access. So that everybody should have some kind of resolution, but it seems that we just keep going round and round. But let, let me get to the map street and the DOT first. That actually probably is a DDC construction project, I would assume. I'm not sure. It's a DEP problem? It, pro it could be a DEP project that DEP Well, the, the, I, was, I, I contacted DOT and they yeah. said, well, we can't uh, use capital resurfacing because Wait. it's not a map street. Yeah, I mean, we have this problem across the city in lots of instances for, for DEP. So when it's not a map street, we're, we're legally not able to do it. But why do we have, why do we have unmapped streets? Because decades ago when the um, borough the borough presidents were in charge of approval. They were approving them even when it, on for private property, not. All right. On the so, right what's away. the solution? I, I'm not sure if I know the solution. I mean, it would require a change of the law. So there are a number of taxpayers that are just lost. They they can't get the services that they're paying. Well, their they knowingly for. bought and purchased property in knowing that that was the case. So it's not like a deceptive practice. I mean, people are aware that they're on private property when they buy the house. What if they were there for 30, 40, 50 years? And that's just, a, so the buyer beware, and you pay your taxes, is that what you're saying? Yeah. That, yeah. Okay, you're saying that. So I mean, you, it, it, it's the law. I'm not, I'm not saying it, I'm just telling you what the law says. I know, but we need, we, see, this is another case. We need solutions to this. We just don't need, uh, well, buyer beware. Right. Because I'm paying my taxes. I pay the same amount of taxes as other people, and yet I'm not on a map street. I can't, no cash basins on the map street. Well, that's actually, for DEP, that's just actually not true. If you have, pri if you're on an unmapped private street, you're not paying DEP, you're not paying for the services because it's a private property and it's private infrastructure. So you're not paying the same amount as your neighbor who is getting the services from DEP. I can't speak for every agency, but you're not paying for the services. No, I'll have to check that one because um, th there are people, we have a lot of uh, streets in my neighborhood that are unmapped and we need to address that. And it's a long process, I was told. But maybe we can talk about it a little bit more. Sure. Um, DOB, what, what solutions do you can't, you can't gain access to uh, an illegal conversion? What do you do? Where's the answer to the people other than we can't gain access? So as you are aware, particularly as it relates to illegal conversions, we do have problems sometimes obtaining access to perform the inspection. Our process is our inspectors will attempt to perform a minimum of two inspections to try and gain access. We have a practice of working um, with uh, folks in the community and complainants to try and time our inspections at such a point in time that we could increase the likelihood of our getting access. In the event we make those two attempts and we're unable to get access, the next step in the process is we can work with the law department to pursue an access warrant. So in the case of an illegal conversion, if there is indicia of that illegal conversion, say multiple mailboxes, doorbells, whatever the case might be, we can work with the law department to get a judge to sign off on a warrant, which will increase the likelihood of our attaining access on the next inspection. So I put the complaint in. Do I get a message about that from 311 or from DOB that here's what you can do now? because we couldn't gain access, which is probably most of the time you can't gain access, would you say? No, it's not most of the time. I'd say on the first instance, the first attempt, we're successful about half the time. And then on that second attempt, if we need to well, make I, it. I would think that that's the, depends on the neighborhood. If it's one, mostly one and two family homes, we see most of the time we're not gaining access, the DOB's not gaining access. Well, the, the, what I'm providing I is I would is like to see it by neighborhood because in my district, we're just not getting access. People just refuse. 
Understood. It, it is certainly a problem. So again, if there's indicia of a little conversion, we'll work with the law department to pursue an access warrant. Okay. Do you, do you think there should be a message that you get when the second uh, they can't gain access, that there should be some recourse? Because it's frustrating for some of the complainants who have this, who put in multiple complaints and each time it's the same result. Your point's well taken. You are right. So um, upon that inspection, if we're not able to obtain access, um, 311, our biz system, will note that we were unable to get access, but it doesn't provide any information, additional information, about the possibility of perhaps securing an access warrant. Yes, and I think we should have that. It's something we should certainly yeah. consider, I would agree. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm looking forward in the future if we could have a system, an alert system uh, for the agency. I know you had your hands full in between these two hearings that we had in 311. We give you uh, a, a huge list of ideas, uh, but I think it will be beneficial and that way we could better assess uh, the level of promptness of, of timely uh, response and you know we're really we're talking about here is precision you know it's precision uh, and precision makes people in excellence makes people feel more comfortable they feel safer and in terms of uh, being able to trust the 311 system unfortunately a lot of times it's directed 311 but it's really like Councilman Rieger mentioned it has to do with all the agencies uh, respond in a timely manner. I, I have to tell you, uh, in my district, I have people that when I say call 311, they tell me they don't do anything. And that's, that really is discouraging. Uh, and I don't say this, I don't come here with a bat to blame. I'm just, I'm very solution focused. And so if we could come up with better systems and structure within your agencies, so we could regain the trust. And the way uh, people feel that, they're, that, that you're trustworthy, it comes down to one thing, that you're for them. And when they feel that you're for them because you're at the very least responding in a timely manner, people feel uh, at least somebody cares. And that goes a long way. I know what you have to do, something, some of the action you have to take takes days, weeks, sometimes months. I mean, it's, it's just the reality of the complexity of problems that our people bring in. But as long as that level of communication, that exchange is taking place, I think um, that uh, it goes a long way. So thank you again. Uh, I, I know I didn't say enough thank yous to this. I want to thank you. I know what you do is, is not, it's not easy. Uh, it's every day. Um, you know, problems. It's just really agencies dealing with citywide problems, 8.5 8 million people. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for the line of questions. They were right on point to the staff that did an amazing job to prepare us. And with that, we conclude today's hearing. Thank you so much.